If you weren't here last week, then you missed the part, the lead up to this story, where in the northern half of Israel, which, which was called Israel back at that time, there had been now a hundred year long slide downward spiritually away from the God of the Bible and a tendency to worship idols instead. And especially in the, with this family of this guy named Omri and his son Ahab, they brought in a Tyrian princess, a Sidonian princess named Jezebel, who was real heavy into worshiping the god Baal. And she brought 450 prophets of Baal with her and also another 400 prophets of Ashereth. And they outlawed at this point the worship of Yahweh. It became illegal to worship God in the northern kingdom. People were being killed. They, they made an effort to kill all of the prophets of God. And, and so it was just really literally to the point where, you know, they were, they, were, they were on the verge of snuffing out the worship of God there. And into this situation, God sent this guy, Elijah, a prophet, and he declared there would be no rain and it would fall. Well, that's ironic because Baal, one of the fruits of worshiping Baal was that Baal was conceived of as the god of the storm. And so one of the things that worshiping Baal was supposed to result in was plenty of rain for your fields, plenty of fertility. And so apparently God chose that very thing to, as a refutation, as a statement that, you know, this Baal you're worshiping is impotent, can't do anything, in fact, doesn't even exist. No such thing. So three years of drought have gone by. Now God comes to Elijah and instructs him, all right, it's time to have this out. And so in the third year of the drought, we read, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab and tell him I will soon end the rain. Well, he goes down there and he's met, uh, I'm going to skip over a few verses. He meets this Obadiah guy who... And trans, uh, transfers his uh, proposal to the King Ahab who then comes and agrees to come out and meet Elijah. And so in verse 17 we read, when Ahab saw him, saw Elijah, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? And Elijah comes right back at him. I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers. You have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now, he says, let's do this. Summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal that you guys have and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel, your wife. So Ahab summoned all the people. It's basically calling them out. Let's have this out. And they come out to Mount Carmel. This is Mount Carmel from space. <laughs> You can see it's kind, of, it's kind of like a range more than a mountain. It's real long but kind of narrow. That's about 50 miles long. And they're probably out at the northeast tip out there by the ocean because we'll see later they are directly over the sea when he tells the guy to go up and look out at the sea. Today they've built a like shrine there to commemorate this event, but they built it clear at the other end. You can't even see the ocean from where they built the shrine, so it's certainly in the wrong position. Anyway, and Elijah gets, so here, there, you see, you see in that picture though, these little depressions and stuff, and apparently they kind of picked an area out there where there was sort of a, uh, you know, an amphitheater effect, and there are probably thousands of people that have gathered for this thing. Well, <clears throat> Elijah gets up and stands in front of them and shouts out, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two op opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. They're probably there like, hmm, yeah. Well, which one is God? It's, man, maybe that's a good question. 
Nobody's going to say anything. And so he proposes, look, I'm the only prophet of the Lord who's left, but Baal has 450 prophets. So it's, I guess for people that believe in volume of prayer or whatever, the, the prophets of Baal should be way ahead on that. He says, let's just bring out here two bulls. The prophets of Baal can choose which one ever they wish. Cut it to pieces, lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on, uh, lay it on the wood on the altar, but I will not set fire to mine either. Then we can call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of Yahweh, the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. So, a simple supernatural act. You know, if God's real, you should be able to do things like this. Basically, to answer prayer. That we can pray, call on the name of your God, and if he answers, then, then, then he's real. Then he's the living God. God's actually there. And so, as these guys line up, and every, they, they agree, of course, the people agree, so I guess the prophets of Baal don't have much choice at this point, since all the people are like, yeah, good idea and stuff, and they're like, hmm, well, okay, so let's, let's try, this, try this out. Not very likely that they're going to get an answer. He hasn't been answering them for the past three years to bring any rain, so I don't know why anything would change right now. But, you know, it's, it's a public spectacle, so they got no choice. And so as they approach Baal to get an answer to this prayer, Elijah pro approaches Yahweh. And uh, when we see, what we see in this confrontation is not, uh, is not a conf confrontation just between the prophets of Baal and, and, and Elijah. It's really a confrontation between two different theologies, two different ways of understanding God and our relationship to him. He says, you guys go first, because there's a lot of you guys. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God. And so they prepared one of the bulls, they placed it on the altar, and then they called on the name of Baal. From morning until noontime, shouting, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. And so it's likely here that we've got probably three hours of work and when you think about it, it's from morning till noontime, and what are they saying that whole time? Oh, Baal, answer us. It doesn't take three hours to say that. They must be saying it like over and over and over, right? I mean, they're keeping, this is basically a repetitive prayer. And it's the kind of thing that Jesus was referring to in the New Testament when he said, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Or as the NASB translates it, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard for their many words. And so we're looking at something that is found not just in Baalism, but actually in religion in general here. In this rep repetitious restating, a chanting actually, a chanting of the same thing over and over and over again. There seems to be a feeling that if we say this, you know, often enough, long enough, maybe somebody will listen. It's related to the concept of magic, and I mean magic here not in our sense of sleight of hand magic, but religious magic. Magic is when people who are into religion believe that there are spiritual beings, there are gods, but they are subject to being manipulated. That if you know the right thing to say, if you know the right motions, if you know the right ingredients to mix together, you can harness the power of divine beings to the task at which you want to, you want to accomplish. Whether it's healing someone, whether it's cursing someone, whether it's protection, whether it's telling the future, the point in religious magic is that by going through this procedure, you can harness spiritual power to 
your, to your ends, whatever it may be. In religious magic, the practitioner, the priest, the shaman, the prophet is the one who has using these arts. Uh, you know, think about, think about saying this over and over for three hours. Oh, Baal, hear answers. Oh, Baal, answers. Oh, Baal, answers. You know, re repetitive prayer like that. What's the point? It's not a, it's not a personal relationship that they're engaging in, is it? I mean, now you don't talk to, to your friends that way. You know, you can just imagine if God, if there was a God there, and, and we're saying something for the, you know, 4,000th time, you'd be like, you already said that. You know, I mean, it would just be, imagine somebody coming up and just saying, you know, how was your day today? 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 You just keep saying that over and over. It'd be completely insane. No, you don't. That's not relation. That's not communication. What is it? A lot of times these repetitive uh, words and uh, motions and other things that go with it have to do with theories of tapping into uh, rhythms and patterns in nature and uh, have the power to compel action from supernatural beings. It's not just found in Baalism at all. In fact, this is very widespread in religion all around the world then and still today. Still today, oh yes. In fact, uh, you know, when I, when I remember when I was a student here, the Krishna consciousness cult was very big and then right on 15th and high, there would be like one or two lines of them there, sometimes 8, 10, 12 of these guys wearing their robes and playing bells. They would sing this little, or chant this, you know, you've heard Hari, Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Hari, Hari, Rama, Rama, and so forth. And then they would, you know, just say this. And so I would go down to class, you know, so at 8, and they were down there, you know, dancing and playing the bells and singing this. And then I would come home from the library at four and they were still doing it. And they'd done that all day long, every day. They'd be down there doing it. You'd think to yourself, good Lord, what is this? It's religion. It's, well, there's nothing special about them. Of course, in our Western religion, we've, to we've toned it down, you know. You might go to the priest, he might say, well, you say, well, I probably shouldn't have done this. He's like, yeah, well, just say this, uh, ten, 10 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers. And so you say, Our Father who art in heaven, and you know, you go through that, and then you say it again, and you say it again, and you say, it again. well, why say it 10 times? Again, God's there like, you already said that, dude. And ironically, that whole prayer, the, the prayer, Our Father, was given in the context of Matthew 6 where Jesus said do not use meaningless repetition instead he says you should pray like this and he gives this simple awesome prayer which ironically has been taken and uh, and brought into a meaningless repetition man humans prefer this approach to God believe it or not the, the odd thing is there is a strong human tendency to want to relate to the divine, the supernatural, through the means of these magical practices. We read that they danced, hobbling about the altar they had made. So as they're crying this out, there's also some sort of a dance that they're doing as they go around in a circle. It's easily recognizable in religion. These are called the gestures of approach. Marcia Eliade explains the sacred, he says, is always dangerous to anyone who comes into contact with it unprepared without having gone through the gestures of approach that every religious act demands. Well, when you think about it, I mean, frankly, we could put a, we could put a video montage of gestures of approach from religions clear around the world right up here tonight and they would be, you know, doing all of their different, uh, it is, it is what happens. When you approach the shrine, you have to make various motions and do different things. And there's dancing. 
It's, it's almost like in, in the, when we think of the repetitious prayer, it's like I'm just going to keep saying it, I'm going to keep saying it until I get an answer. Here now we're getting the body into it as well. And so you get this feeling that there's all this oomph coming up from the human side. It's like, oh, come on, bam, bam, bam. And it's like, oh, man, come on. <laughs> and so uh, there's terrific oomph and, and effort coming up from the human side in, in this theology. Well, around noontime, Elijah began to mock them. Hey guys, you're going to have to shout louder, he says. For surely he's a god. I mean, perhaps he's daydreaming or maybe he's relieving himself. Might have gone off to the side, take a dump, you know. <laughs> maybe he's away on a trip or he's asleep and needs to be awakened. You know, we read this and it's like, oh, so he's making fun of them. Yeah, because, you know, every one of these things would be true of their nature deities. Yes, they did have to sleep. And if you read the mythology, read the lore, they do sleep, they eat, they do defecate and urinate. Yeah, all those things. They're just, they're overgrown, uh, you know, humans really. They're not infinite. They're not omnipotent. And in a word, what, what, what Elijah's doing is he's critiquing belief in a nature deity. He's basically saying that, uh, that such a man-made God needs a lot of encouragement to overcome the deficiencies. You know, he, he can't hear you. He's too far away, so he'll have to shout louder so he can hear. Not an infinite personal God at all. This is a finite, a limited deity. Well, they took the bait. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. And so they shouted louder. And following their normal custom, they began to cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. Oh, man. Whoa. So they're going, uh ah, -huh. this is really, uh, this is really getting extreme. Shouting, dancing, and now cutting and bleeding all over the place. What is, what is this part? with the blood. <laughs> you know, it kind of fits the pattern though. It's just a further extension when you think about it. This is what the, in the New Testament is referred to as a self-abasement and harsh treatment of the body. There's a very interesting passage about this in the book of Colossians chapter 2. This one Christian group was being urged by some false teachers to get into this the harsh treatment of the body. Uh, it's a common thought on, to religious man that, you know, well, we're not being answered here. So what we need to do, you know, is we've got to convince Baal that we mean business, that we are, it's our sincerity that is, that is being demonstrated here. <sighs> Look at that! You, you think that doesn't hurt? You know, and, and so there's kind of a, you can see kind of the, uh, again, the oomph, all of the work coming up from the human side to try to compel Baal to listen. In the New Testament, in this passage in Colossians, Paul says, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. As a matter of fact, none of this in, in hairs into spirituality whatsoever. Properly understood, uh, this ascetic ideal very big in Western religion, too. You know, Christianity has a rich history in asceticism, sleeping on nail beds, wearing hair shirts, starving, uh, you know, fasting yourself, uh, and so forth. Medieval uh, mystics did incredible, went to incredible lengths of self torture and, and bled just like this. And, and often in their thing, there's also the thought here of suppressing the flesh, you know, putting the flesh down by tormenting it. But Paul says, properly understood, such things are acts of the flesh. This is nothing but fleshliness. This has nothing to do with the spirit whatsoever. Worthless. In fact, I think it's much more than worthless. It's sinister. 
kind of picture does this paint of God? What if God wanted, you know, people, what, what sort of God would want people to torment their body, to practice harsh treatment of the body? What is this saying? What, you know, I think of myself, and I've had people, I've taught this passage before and had people come up and say, you know, I think it's kind of arrogant to be you know, making fun of these people's religion. This is their sincerely held religious belief. I think we should be putting it down. Um, I'm sorry. I can't go with that. You know, here's why. What if my, uh, what if my daughter came up, you know, and knocked at, knocked at my door and I came out and she's like, Dad, look. And, you know, her arms are just running with blood. She just slashed herself with swords and knives. I did this for you. I mean, what about that? Think about it. What if that happened? There's her friend standing with her. <laughs> You'd be like, what the hell? Right? I mean, what did you do to yourself? Like, you, you've cut yourself all over the... And you think that I would want this? You think that that would somehow please me? That you would cut your body? What do you think I am? A monster? And her friends may very well stand there and say, you know, Dennis, she worked pretty hard on that. I think you should show a little more appreciation. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think so. No. All the worse that you worked hard on it. There's something, there's something, I think, kind of vile being projected here. A picture of God who has that power to bless, who has the ability to do the supernatural, but is clutching it, unwilling to give it out, has to be pried from his unwilling fingers through the cruelest self-sacrifice. And so uh, finally he may be like, okay, hell, and throws out the blessing we seek. Not out of love at all. There is no love in this, any of this picture. That's the, really the missing piece, isn't it? There's a, a huge missing piece right there. Asceticism. This is really, uh, it's a sure mark of the religious mentality and, uh, and again, it's not just a Baal worship. This, is, this whole passage is a critique of what we could call the religious mentality. Something that has afflicted even the guys in the Old Testament practiced the same thing. God was always pulling his hair out sort of when, through the prophets saying, what are you thinking? Going through the motions. And what I am interested in is your heart. He says, you, you go through all these rituals. You recite by rote all these memorized prayers and stuff like that. And he says, but your heart is far from me. There's nothing happening between you and me in your heart. You're just going through these outward motions of religion. And God says, it makes me sick. Please, he says, don't do it anymore. Well, they raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. This is probably maybe 4 or so p.m. This has been going on for seven hours of work. A grueling, desperate effort to get an answer. And we read, but still, there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Why? Why wouldn't anyone answer? Well, hopefully you know the answer to that. Folks, there's no such thing as bail, okay? It didn't matter what they did. They were never going to get an answer because there, no, there is no person like that. If we can believe anything that the Bible says, God says, I'm the only guy up here, okay? There's just one God, and it's me. And so, it's not that they weren't sincere. It's that it's not enough to be sincere. They were sincere. They must have been sincere. Seven hours of work, including slashing yourself with knives and swords. Oh my God, if that's not sincerity, what is? These guys were sincere. I think they believed. Uh, <laughs> the problem is... Yes, it was a sincerely held belief, but also completely false. 
And that's a major problem. Just because they believed it didn't make it true. There is no such thing as bail. A huge problem. You know, hardly anyone believes in bail these days. I can't remember the last time I met a bail worshiper. <laughs> this whole mythology is passed out of use. No one believes in it anymore. Well, um, it's not up to a vote anyway. It doesn't matter what we believe. Our beliefs are not what the issue is here. The issue is what's really there. And in that case, we find that aside from having kind of a real twisted religious theology, an even more serious problem is that they have faith in an object that is non-existent. Well, they give up. And so it's Elijah's turn. He calls out to the people, come on over here. And they all gather around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. There must have been an old uh, altar there that used to be there. We read that he took the 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord, dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. And he piled the wood on, cut the bull into pieces, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering in the wood. This is a sign there near the ocean right there because there wasn't any water in any of the streams or, or, or springs. They must have run down to the ocean to get this water. They're pouring it all over there. And then he says, uh, yeah, after they've done this, he says, yeah, go do the same thing again. So he keeps sending these guys running down to get more, more of these flagons full of water and bringing them up and they're pouring it all over again a third time. And so... Finally, the water was just running down the altar and even filling up this trench that he had dug around it and stuff. Things totally, entirely soaked with water. Well, it's pretty clear what Elijah's doing, isn't it? He's demonstrating, look, we don't need to help God. I mean, you know, you look at this and you're like, that's, that's all wet. That's not going to burn. Yeah, well, we're not talking, you know, we're not spelling God with a little G here. This is, this is the living God, all right? This is the real God. And so this isn't, a, this isn't a trick or something like that. So totally soak the thing down. And so then at the usual time for the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed. And so we get, by example, a teaching on Elijah's theology of prayer right here. Very different. First he says, O Lord... God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. So the first thing he is, addresses God and says, God, oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And just as we find throughout uh, the Bible, God is revealed as a God who shows himself through his works in history. A very unique feature found in biblical teaching. Gods typically in religious thought are revealed as nature gods, but not Yahweh. Yahweh doesn't reveal himself. It does say that the heavens declare his glory and so on. There are, you know, it is, there are verses that talk about how, you know, you can see God in nature. You can see his handiwork there and stuff. But for every one of those, there's 20 that talk about God as the God who did this. I am the God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. And he identifies himself by the great works that he's done in history. And so he, he addresses him that way. Prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. Here is the key to Elijah's power in prayer. Is that all that I've done here, everything I've done here, I'm doing because you commanded me to do it. You, your word instructed me to do that. Elijah is praying in accordance with the word of God. And so this is why God is going to answer his prayer. It's not because Elijah's going to get so intense and, oh God, oh God, 
And I'll, oh, Lord, oh. And uh, it's pictured this way sometimes. I've read commentaries. So they're like, well, it's his expectancy. They base it on the book of James, chapter 5, where he says he prayed earnestly that God would not send rain and so on. And they say it was the earnestness of anything. No, that's Baal theology. That's, that's what they thought, is that you have to get earnest, and that's how you get answers from God. If you want what we know as Christians, when we come to pray to God, we're not trying to get God to do our thing for us. We come to God saying, God, what's your thing? That's what we want to know. What is your thing? Because I want to get on board with that. And in many cases, God has already told us what his thing is. Like here. God had told Elijah earlier, this is my thing. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. And so he says, show them that everything I've done, this was not my idea. This was your instruction throughout. And if we are praying to God in accordance with his word, he will answer. That's the key to answering in prayer. Not fasting, not how many times you say it, not how earnest you are, but are you praying in accordance with the will of God? 1 John 5 verse 14, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he would grant it. We say, well, what if what I'm asking isn't according to his will? Look, if you knew God, if any of us who know God realize if it's not his will, then I don't want it. Why would I want something that wasn't the will of God? It's not going to be the best for me. You know, if God doesn't want it, he's got a good reason for it because he's all-knowing. And to trust God means that he actually knows what's good for me more than I know what's good for myself. Well, and so he says this, and he says, Lord, answer me, answer me so that these people will know that, you, oh Lord, that you are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and even the dust, and it licked up the water and the trench. And they just all standing there like, I don't believe that just happened. Oh my God, everything vaporized. I bet God drew this out for a few seconds just for effect. <laughs> I would have if I was him anyway. It's probably just... And they're just there like, and then it's, you know, it's gone. They're just like, nothing there. <laughs> Boy, the contrast between uh, these two is pretty striking right down the line, isn't it? You know, Elijah's whole prayer is two verses. This whole thing, his whole prayer went down in like 10 to 15 seconds. And the result, boom! It totally blows this thing away, even the water they'd poured all over it. So it is a real statement. It is over. And when the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, Yahweh, he is God. Yes, Yahweh is God. And so the day was won. But it's not over yet. Check this out. Then Elijah commanded, seize Oh, the prophets of Baal, don't let a single one escape. And so the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. What about that? Oh, my good Lord. He slew them. Okay. Uh, there it is. All right. Yes, as a matter of fact, you know, when you think about it, though, and there's a good chance that these guys would have been executed even today. In the practice of human sacrifice that went on in connection with Baal worship, the likelihood is high that each one of these prophets of Baal, these priests, had killed multiple people with their own hands. Not to mention the several thousand prophets of Yahweh that had been put to death. These guys were serial killers. And according to... God, they deserve to die for that. And for something even more serious, they didn't just kill people's bodies. They were also destroying people's souls. And that's pretty serious. That's even more serious. You know, our bodies are all going to die eventually anyway. Hardly any of us get out of here alive, do we? But to destroy someone's soul is a pretty serious matter. 
And if we can believe what God says, then he is really there. And it does matter whether we follow him or we follow Baal. And so by enforcing Baal worship on this culture was a pretty serious matter. And according to Old Testament law, it was a capital offense. Although in, in these guys' case, even our culture probably would have considered them uh, worthy of execution. And then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Well, he didn't really hear it, but I mean, this is basically the, the eyes or the ears of faith. He's, he's imagining that this is about to happen. But the reason, again, that he has faith on this is because God has told him already, that's what I'm going to do. And so he's working directly out of the word of God here. So Ahab went to eat meat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go up and look toward the sea. The servant went up and looked. He come back to Elijah. He said, I don't see anything. He keeps praying. And this, this happened seven different times. Well, now that's a little strange right there too, isn't it? This brings up a pretty interesting thought, uh, that, you know, because here, of course, uh, the prophets of Baal, they raved for seven hours. Hardly said anything the whole time. And but here he's praying and he has to send his servant up seven different times. Looks kind of repetitive in its own right, doesn't it? Well, uh, I'm not going to dwell on it a lot, but the Bible definitely draws a distinction, Jesus did, between the concept of meaningless repetition and persistence in prayer. Uh, to persever persevere in prayer is something that happens when you uh, have a promise from God that he will fulfill this and you believe it and it hasn't been fulfilled yet so you continue to pray about it waiting expectantly you see an expectancy in the prayer that he keeps sending his servant up to see if he's answered yet and that you would naturally continue to pray about that as long as it continues to be an, an issue the biggest difference between meaningless repetition well there's, there's several differences one is that it's contentful because he's doing this at God's command, and so there was direct truth uttered to him by God here, which he's believing, as opposed to meaningless repetition, which is just, uh, I decide that I'm going to try to compel God to do something uh, through my repetition. And then two, that it's a matter of motives, the motives that you have, whether you're doing this to, uh, to bring forward what God has declared he wants, what he wants, or whether you're exercising magic and trying to make God do what you want. Anyway, finally the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah goes nuts. He's like, shout it out. He yelled at Ahab, tell him, climb in your chair and get back down if you don't hurry. The rain will stop you. It hasn't rained in three years plus. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought the terrific rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. And the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. <laughs> this is the verse I talked about earlier in James 5 where they talk about how Elijah was a human like we are. Nothing special about Elijah. He was just a dude. And he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall and none fell for three and a half years. Actually, prayed earnestly is a questionable translation. If you're interested in these kind of things, study this verse and do uh, study what the commentators say because all it really says in the Greek is he prayed with prayer. And some people understand it to mean he prayed earnestly. But I kind of agree with Motyer, a scholar who argues that what it means is he prayed and that was all he did was pray. And that's what that expression means. Nobody's really sure. Well, we're done with our reading. Let's try to draw some conclusions from this whole story tonight. We saw in James that Elijah was a man just like us. Yeah, I mean, he was chosen to be a prophet, but I mean, he's still just flesh and blood. He had the same passions we do. He had the same weaknesses we do. We'll see all about that next week. Because it goes on and, and all of a sudden this, this awesome dude is like supposed to be so together and everything completely loses it and makes kind of a fool of himself. 
So, you know, uh, the, the key was not that Elijah was a special person. Yeah, maybe he was in a special situation. It was a pretty extreme situation he was in, but he was just like us, according to James. It wasn't how hard or intensely that he prayed. The ones that were doing the intense praying were the Baal prophets. They got nothing for all that work. They were intense, man. Elijah just walks up. He says two sentences. And that's it. And the reason that he's answered is that he prayed in accordance with the will of God. And that's when we will be answered too. You have to learn as believers and followers of Christ, learn to pray according to the will of God. And we have guidance from that to pray in the word of God, to pray the word of God like Jesus did. When you see him confronting the evil one in the wilderness, the way he would, each time he would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so he knew the power of the word of God, that God carries out his word. And that's the key to victorious prayer. His prayer, we'll see in this too, is relational and it's contentful. In stark contrast to the magical work of the Baalists. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, because in that whole magical thing, what's really missing there? It's not a personal relationship. But when Elijah goes up, it's like he's talking to somebody he knows, right? It's like, God, show these people that everything I just did here was at your word. Show them that you're the true God. And boom, that's all there is to say. God heard him the first time. And so that's how we should relate to God as well. That's really the lesson of the story. If you want to relate to the real God, then be real with him. And that means... Not trying to get him uh, in a hammerlock and twist his arm to get him to do what you want. But rather relating to him as a friend and as somebody in a relationship, a, a love relationship. That's what God wants with us is he wants a relationship of love there. And the problem is we don't understand God. We think of him as this force that we have to try to get control of or, or hope that we can avoid trouble with him, you know. We're distant from God and he wants us to draw close to him in a relationship. That's really what following the Lord is all about. Old Testament and New as well. Of course, this becomes even clearer with uh, the teaching in the New Testament. But it was right there in the Old Testament as well. And that is that God is a personal God. He's not a force at all. He's not just this essence. He's a being like us. And he's a being of love. And he wants to love people. So if you want to get in there with God, you've got to come to him on a relational basis, in heart, in, in honesty. There, there needs to be content and truth where we accept what he's given us of himself. You know, he has revealed himself. We'd be in huge trouble if God was out there, but he had never revealed himself to us. We'd have no way of knowing what he's like, who he is, anything. We could probably tell there must be a God. I mean, you, there's enough evidence for that. But what, what kind of person is he? What is he? We could never know unless he had spoken and revealed himself. Well, most of us are well aware of this. And, you know, there's good reason to think that he has done exactly that. And that this, this word that we're reading, the scriptures, the Bible, is nothing less than a place where God has revealed himself. And he revealed his love there and he revealed that Jesus has paid the price for our sins and that we don't have to worry about that, that we can come to him as a free gift without earning it, that we need to accept what Jesus has done on our behalf and tell him that and invite him into our lives and start a relationship. You invite the Spirit of God literally enters you when you open your heart to the Lord, he comes into your life. We read in Revelations 3, Jesus speaking says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man open that door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. But it's up to us to open the door. We say, well, what's opening the door mean? What does that mean? It means, God, yes, come in and be with me. I want to be with you. I don't want to be separated. And that's how you start a relationship with God. And then it's just a matter of, of building your relationship. You know, so that's, that's what spiritual growth really is. It's just deepening this relationship with God. And that, of course, can go on for years. 
where we come to know him in a deeper, deeper way. Well, so there's 1 Kings 18.